change my voice and say begin to lie down or bring your awareness yoga nidra dog would jump on the bed and crash it every day and the sudden start to say begin to stretch your fingertips the dog would get up and it wouldn't know where it was but it would get up and then start running around every day so i didn't really know how much the lady lady learned but the dog was definitely experiencing yoga nidra <laughs> So <laughs> this intrigued me, and that's why yoga nidra is very fond of as a modality. Then I read many years later that Swami Satyanand Saraswati, who formulated the yoga nidra module in the 1960s, he says that he trained his alsatian in yoga nidra. So I was very happy because uh, <laughs> I was not so way off the mark. So animals take to meditation quite easily. The one thing that I love when I used to have a dog is that it's a great uh, lesson in contentment. Like I want to go all over the world, and my dog will never leave the locality that I stay in, but it's absolutely content. Uh, so I get that, you know, all with the tree. It's very f- tough to find a content human being, but to find a content animal or a plant is very blissful. At the same time, I appreciate the fact that I'm capable of poetry or music. and her nervous system doesn't permit that so it's nice to sort of see it's a beautiful things emotionally from the dog but the beautiful capabilities that we have that she does now so. we good to go okay voila If you've already gotten irritated with my voice, this is the last three hours that I'll be talking. So you can recover over the next twenty-one days. <laughs> Bring your hands into Namaste, and just sit down still. Over the next three hours, we're going to study the origins of yoga. If you don't know where it's coming from, you won't know where you're going with this. And then we'll study modern yoga, the history of modern yoga. When we study history, we are not really only focusing on the chronology. But I'm going to give you a lot of insight into the way. i perceive these people now please understand history his story yeah the objective in my opinion whether the buddha lived in 553 bce or 525 bce is not so important what is important is that what has he contributed to our understanding of the subject so please note everything that i'm sharing is my personal take on all of this Yeah, over the years of learning and ruminating on all of this, may or may not match what you've read, learnt, or what you believe. Yeah, it's my perspective on all of this. It's interesting to be able to share this, to take it in, and then to see what of that matches. I'd like to share one thing in the Indian tradition. We don't really value. the written word so much <laughs> it's really funny i'm sure you worked with indians you send them an email they are not going to open it you have to call them and say i sent you an email have you experienced that yeah yeah we never really value the written word so much we value the spoken word so much so that the vedas which are the ancient texts in the culture that defines the culture 
we say that the right usage of the Vedic knowledge is in the oral transmission. Yeah? So therefore, this is a very beautiful experience. I could have given it to you as sheets of paper, but uh, I don't expect you to trust the sheets of paper. Right? This is more interesting. The lot of philosophy comes from the Upanishads. The word Upanishad means uh, in the presence or around or at the feet of the teacher. I'm not saying me, please, that's not the point. I'm just saying Upanishad means in the presence or at the feet of the teacher, listening. Yeah? So the whole culture is around a listening culture. Right? For that to understand why this is so, now, the next time you deal with Indians, you know this as a perspective. A friend of mine is a, a creative director in an advertising agency, so he was, he's done a PhD on the subject. If you go to India, you'll see the board here, right? MG Road. And yet, somebody will come and ask you, is this MG Road? They're on the board. But nobody's going to believe the board. They still need to hear it. <laughs> uh, so he's a creative director. So he was telling me that when his, when his Indian... Uh, copywriters come to him with an ad written in English, they will say, read this out. And they'll give it to him to read. But when his Marathi or Kannada or Hindi copywriters come to him, they say, just sit and they'll read it out for him. So in the vernacular, the heard word is given a lot of significance. Yeah? It's just a little bit of a perspective. The reason that the symbol Om, this is in the Devanagari script, that's one of the ancient scripts of Hindi is written in the Devanagari script. Now, what is the origin of Om? Since we are at the house of Om, let's start by understanding that. The closest ancient world understanding of the creation of the universe to the Big Bang is the Tantra understanding. Right? So the one problem with the Big Bang theory is how can everything come from nothing? Physics cannot wrap its head around that. We've accepted it. We just accept it as a working model as of today. Is that right? But how can everything at that point, when at that dot, when everything was infinitesimally small and then became the cosmos, even then, before that particular moment, nothing becomes something doesn't make sense. Is that okay? <laughs> yes, no. So what does Tantra have to say about it? Tantra says this beautiful thing that in the beginning was consciousness. At the, when the desire to manifest was there, at the point of creation or the Big Bang, consciousness got manifest as energy. So the first thing, even we say Big Bang, the sound, the first thing that happened was the spandan a vibration. That vibration was heard as nada sound. That sound was Om. So that is the root of Om. Therefore, in deep states of meditation, yogis started to hear Om. It's not man-made in that sense. It was heard. Yeah? It was man-observed, we can say. And that then became the basis of an entire culture, an entire practice, that Om is this mystical sound. Aum. It's said to be the sound of the cosmos. In my recollection of the fact, I really don't care to know whether a device can measure this in the outer space or no. It's not the intriguing thing for me. It could perhaps at some point. But what's really interesting is that how can I sensitize my system to see whether this is really audible or no? Why should I rely on a Hubble telescope or, a, or some other sound system? If these guys have heard it, can we also try and hear it? Therefore, I would request you not to believe Yoga is not interested in your belief. It's interested in your experimenting quality. Yeah? Just because somebody says this is the sound of the cosmos, you don't have to believe it. But you have to be open-minded and intrigued enough to check. Is it right? 
Is it not? Yeah? Is that okay? Yeah? It's not dogma. This is science. If you find that this is not right and it is something else, it changes. Thus far, nobody has challenged this. So for 5,000 years, this sound has been going on. Yeah? So much so that you have ah, ah, um, Amen, Amen. It's the same sound. You put a nasalization N, and then in the Christian tradition it becomes Amen. In the Islamic tradition it becomes Amin. It's the same syllables we are working with. Anybody, the human body is the same. So in deep states of silence, you're beginning to hear um. That's what I'd like to share with you in terms of Om, the origins of Om. Yeah. There, are, there are Vedas describing Om as the sound of the creator, the sound of creation. As we have the biblical gospel begin with, in the beginning there was the sound and the sound was God. So sound is given so much significance in ancient cultures. Today, we have a very rudimentary understanding of sound. Yeah? We're just about scratching the surface. We're just about beginning to say that there is some such thing called sound energy. In Tantra, there's a beautiful theory that says that uh, the whole universe is frozen sound. <laughs> so everything is a vibration as we discussed, as quantum physics telling us the same today, if everything is a vibration and there's a sound to everything, this tree or this bamboo is a frozen vibration and that vibration is different from this, so it has a different viscosity. But everything is audible. Right? I would like you to sort of experiment more and more and more. The point that I'll leave you with at this stage, and you can ask all the teachers, they'll have different viewpoints about Ohm. Over the years, I have tried my level best to cut the information that I give. Yeah? If you had asked me about Om 10 years ago, I could have spoken for two hours. Because I didn't really know, and therefore I had to tell everything. <laughs> but over the years, over the years, over the years, over the years, you try and remove the thing that is extraneous. The thing that you don't really relate to, you knock it off, 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 till you fine tune your ideas. Right? Now, when it comes to Om, most languages start with A, whether it's Greek, whether it's Arabic, and M is the last syllable, not the last letter, but M finishes any word. If you make any word that ends with mm, you cannot add anything else to it. So, mm, these are the three sounds that you can make without the use of your tongue. Yeah? Uh, um, only three sounds you can make without using your tongue. So therefore, this is primordial. Yeah? And the last point that I want to share with you, why is this called Anahata Chakra? Anahata means unstruck, unhad nad. You can hear me because my vocal cords are striking each other. It's a struck sound. The water on the rock, we can hear it. In deep states of meditation, you hear a sound here that has no primordial source. Or rather, is a primordial sound and it has no source. Therefore, unhad nad, unstruck sound. Because it's coming from this part of the body, we call this chakra anahata chakra. I'm sure all of you are very familiar with the word anahata. It's a very popular word these days. Anahata, that's the way the word comes. It's based on sound. So in yoga, the classical yoga meditation is all about listening to the inner sound. Can I hear my heartbeat? Can I hear more? Many years ago when I worked, my teacher, he holds his heartbeat for many minutes. And we were asking him, like, why, why do you do this? He says that uh, in deep states of meditation, the heart becomes a distraction. It's too loud. <laughs> I wouldn't know because uh, the heartbeat's not loud enough or I'm not silent enough. 
that the heart rate, the heart beat itself is a distraction. But yogic masters, they do this. Right? Uh, so the search is always for an internal sound so deep. Classical Indian musicians, what they hear, they try to recreate. So when you want to meditate, always use classical music. Yeah? It could be even Western classical, Beethoven, Mozart. They're playing what they hear in deep states. They are not creating what the market wants. They are just expressing what they are hearing in silence. So it will get you into those states. Because especially in the Indian classical tradition, music is considered a spiritual discipline. We call the same word sadhana for a musician training. So much so that classical meditation is all about listening to the sound. It's very interesting because when you study the chakras, you'll see the first chakra deals with smell, taste, sight, touch, sound. As soon as you start to listen, immediately you're somewhere here. Yeah. Sound, very, very important. Can we move on from Om? Yeah. Shall we do an Om together? Now that you know, or rather you are curious to know. Please figure it out yourself. <laughs> this is the approach in yoga. This is the approach. Uh, you can ask me the question at lunch. Uh, if the question still exists. Okay. Go for it. No, it's because you say there are only three sounds that can make yeah. that we can make without the sound. Yeah. I can say A and B without my sound. Your tongue is mo your tongue is moving. You can check. But that was my question. Like sure, sure, sure. Who, who is part of home? Aum. A U M. Yeah? But if you say T, my tongue's used. If I say Z, F, like that. You can check. You can check. What I'm saying is not you know, the end of the subject. You can check. You can look in front of a mirror, check whether you're using the tongue. Shall we do an home together? There are four elements, A, U, M, and the silence after. A, conscious mind, U, subconscious, M, unconscious, and the silence is the fourth, or Turaya state, superconscious. Let's begin with the history of yoga, that was Om. When you study the history of yoga, uh, some of it you can write, most of it is just storytelling. The first master of yoga we call as Adi Yogi. Are the first yogi. So we say about eight, nine thousand years ago, there appeared a being in the Himalayas who was very unique. He would spend his time wildly dancing or sitting in deep silence. So much joy that tears would flow. Wildly dancing or just sitting in silence. Immediately people gathered around him because they understood that he belongs to a different paradigm. Yeah, when you see somebody from a different paradigm, you know that that person is something special. So a lot of people came and they wanted to learn from him. He couldn't care less. He continued his life. And most of them left. Seven people stayed back. He gave them some practices to do. And he went on with his life. After 84 years, he looked back upon them and saw that now they were ready to learn. <laughs> the time, of course, is different in different eons, but 84 years is not a joke. Yeah? Now, most people come to a spiritual person for curiosity. I just want to check this guy out, figure out something. I can go have a conversation with my friends and say I do meditation. Those kind of people left. The seven people for whom this was life-changing stayed back. 
on the next full moon night, we celebrate it as Guru Purnima, the first full moon after the summer solstice. On Guru Purnima night, he sat facing the south and started to teach these seven people. Therefore, he became from Adi Yogi to Adi Guru, the first Guru. Yeah? The word Gu means darkness, Ru means light. A person who takes you from your darkness to your light. Today we use it very flippantly, the marketing guru. You know, but the word is very revered in the Indian tradition. I may be teaching for nearly 20 years. I'm still a teacher. A guru is qualitatively different. It's very different. Yeah? I can be teaching for 60 years and I may still be a teacher. Guru is qualitatively different. Yeah? The question arises, what is that qualitative difference? I'll leave you to figure it out. Yeah? Uh, it's no fun sharing. Maybe at some point I will share my time with my teacher, if you have the time, but it's nice for you to experience. It's not expertise that we are after. It is a qualitative difference that comes through expertise, yes, but a transformation has happened. Just to put this in context, there's a very famous psychologist called William James who narrates the story that on a given day, he was very depressed, his wife asked him what happened. He said that he used to go to the mental asylum to do his work daily. He said, Today I understood that the difference between me and the people in the madhouse is just this. They are talking loudly but I'm talking softly to myself the whole day. There's no qualitative difference. It's just that I'm talking softly the whole day and they're talking loudly. I can be functional, they can't be. I don't know when I'll slip. That's how we are. The a yogi is that qualitatively different person for whom silence is whenever he wants it to be. So like that, a guru is qualitatively different. It's not quantity. Is that clear? You could be teaching for 90 years and you may still not be a guru of the subject. You can be a PhD in the subject, but that still doesn't mean anything. So he became Adi Guru that day. He started to teach them. These seven people are called as the Sapta, seven rishis, sages. These seven people then took the science. So what did he teach them? He didn't teach them techniques. He transmitted the science. There are two things I want you to remember. One, he is supposed to have discovered 114 ways to enlightenment. Now, immediately you realize this is a very creative person. It's a very playful person. The Buddha discovers one way to enlightenment job done. This man is trying to find 114, he says, there are 108 chakras in the body, so you can attain through any of them, and there are six ways beyond the body. Now, this is just for us to learn and understand, but essentially, here's a very creative person able to play with life. So he teaches them the science, they make techniques. So what is the science, for example, that the sun energizes the whole planet. That's science. Technique would be Surya Namaskar. So they made techniques. And I don't mean Surya Namaskar. I just mean techniques. And they traveled across the known world to teach. Agastya Muni came to South India. Others went on beyond the Himalayas to different parts of the world. That spine of knowledge from Tantra. Tantra is the mother of all spiritual traditions. Yoga comes from Tantra. I would like to spend the time to explain to you what is Tantra. Today it gets very bad press. Somebody wants to have a sexual activity and that's called Tantra. It's a very small part of the Tantra journey. What does Tantra mean? Tanoti, expansion. Trayati, liberation. You get liberated by your expanded worldview. For example, my father, say, was an alcoholic and we, have a, we had a problem. 
now I start to drink so much, so I understand that he was not a weird person or he was not a bad person. Just a little bit of chemicals in what he drank made him behave in a certain way. Through my expanded understanding of alcoholism, I have liberated myself from my hatred towards my father. Does that make sense? Yeah? Yes, no? Yes. Yeah? That is the journey of Tantra. That by expanding your worldview, you liberate your limiting beliefs. Yeah? Now, Tantra. So what is the relation between sexual activity and Tantra? A lot of systems around the world say you can either use your energy for sex, or you can use it for meditation. In the Christian tradition, priests don't have families. In the Buddhist tradition, monks don't have families. So they are, they are, you're basically saying, you either reach, if you want to serve or attain to the divine, you don't let go of energy in sexual or family work. In Tantra, the idea is that, who are you to decide what is sacred and what is profane? Everything is an opportunity to attain to beyond human. Why are you deciding that when I'm in the temple, I'm sacred, and when I'm in the bedroom, I'm profane? Or when I'm in the kitchen, I'm profane? Everything. So in Tantra, every human activity is an opportunity to make it prayer. If I can be prayerful during the sexual act, I can be prayerful anytime. Because during that act, you're farthest from the center. If you can be prayerful at that time, you can be prayerful at any time. When I use the word prayerful, I don't mean it in a religious context. I mean it in a deep context. Is that clear? Does that explain to you? I'll take questions later. Does that explain to you what is the idea behind Tantra? That any activity can be used to make your whole day a meditation. Yeah. Now, give me your book. Suppose I were to put my leg here. She may not like it. Right? She may not like it. But that's just our idea, or our idea, that my leg is dirty and my hand is not. Yeah? It's the human body. We have made this idea that I cannot put my foot on your book, or my book, but I can put my hand. Like that, we have millions of limiting beliefs. Right? It's just, what is the difference between the foot and this? Nothing. If this is sacred, so is this. Right? So much so that, suppose, like sometimes you're doing yoga, people, the students will not do shavasana like this. They'll turn the head towards the teacher and do shavasana. It's very cute. But there's really no difference whether your leg is facing me or my, your head is facing me. Is that right? It's just one and the same. So how do you then overcome these limiting ideas through your experience of life? That is the journey of Tantra. You will not find any Tantra teachers teaching Tantra. The people who are teaching Tantra workshops have no clue. It is too beautiful a subject for anybody to teach. It is not a process-driven subject. Yoga is process-driven. I can teach you yoga. Tantra is not like that. Is that clear? Yeah? You, may, you may go for a workshop. It's intimacy. It's Kama Sutra. Tantra is too beautiful. The masters of Tantra are living in the mountains or wherever they are they are not going to come down and teach you a three-hour workshop for a little bit of cash. Yes. These are people who can play with life. Yeah. They're too beautiful. Too beautiful. Yeah. So let's not trivialize this entire science. Yeah. Now, once you know how to play with life, some jokers use that to do magic. In India, we call it black magic. Yeah. You take an amulet, you do some mantras on that, you put it there, and then that person gets a disease. It happens across the world. It's not a big deal. Yeah. When you do enough in meditation, you will get certain powers. As you'll study in the Yoga Sutras, Patanjali 
says there are, you get 18 powers, one of 18. They are distractions on the journey. You try to go beyond that. You started yoga for peace. Suddenly, now you can read her thoughts. I can't. I'm just... <laughs> you can suddenly read her thoughts. Is that why you started? Are you going to make that your calling card? No. You start for peace. Now you can hear her thoughts. But if you meditate a little bit more, you'll go beyond that. If you try to use that, your journey stops. Is that clear? Yeah? I'm trying to debunk the rubbish myths around Tantra. Why it gets bad press, not today, for the last 200 years. Because some guys use it for black magic. Now it's being used in a... It's, some, it's, it's a bit esoteric and therefore... But it is the most beautiful journey simply because any and everything is spiritual. Yeah. Any and everything. There's no distinction. So I'd like you to just take a little bit of time to let that settle in. Because this is the great contribution of Adi Yogi. Adi Yogi is known as Shiva. We don't use the word Shiva in the yogi tradition because we are distinguishing the religion and yoga. Yoga predates organized religion. When man first started to have this, so what is the beauty of Tantra? You know how you define a human being Tantra? I've never found a more poetic definition. Gut Akasha. Gut means an earthen pot. Akasha means the cosmos. I am an earthen pot that contains the cosmos within. Therefore, my job in life is to break this pot, this limited sense of identity. And then I realize that I am the cosmos. How beautiful is that? How beautiful is that? Gut Akasha. Yeah? Gut Akasha. An earthen pot with the cosmos within. All I have to do is break my limiting identity of who I am. This is the beauty of Tantra, the magic. Yoga comes from there. All the spiritual traditions come from Tantra. Because what is basically Tantra saying? You reach a point where you say, I have to break free. I have to break free of physical, mental, emotional limitations. All of us have reached that point, otherwise you wouldn't be spending three weeks here. You wouldn't be inquiring. When you reach that point where you say there has to be more to life, that is the journey of Tantra. Yeah? And then there's subsections and so on and so forth. But essentially, I want to break free from my limited identity. So you can take a couple of minutes that lets me also relax. And you can write whatever you feel you got from that. Clear why we don't call him Shiva? Because when you call him Shiva, then it becomes Hindu. Right? Uh, in the sense that people may even pray and worship to him. We are looking at that aspect of the same personality that deals with meditation, expression. So to not be in this confusion, we have this distinction. I'm not exactly sure how it's been described in your book, but are we clear with what Tantra is? Expanded, liberating yourself by an expanded worldview, by understanding life. Yeah. What is the risk in Tantra training? You have to be so centered because you can very easily lose yourself. Yeah. But if you don't take the risk of going beyond, you're never going to learn anything. It requires a lot of courage, a lot of centering. Let's move on to the next master. And we look at Krishna. Are we all familiar with Krishna? Yes, no? 
you would have seen a lot of statues of a man on a chariot speaking to a man with a bow. So this is the setting of the Bhagavad Gita. The Bhagavad Gita is the most uh, well-known scripture in the Hindu pantheon. Yeah? Can I explain to you a little bit about Sanatana Dharma? I think you need to get that in context to understand Krishna and especially Buddha. The word Hinduism is a very new word. It first appeared in the Encyclopedia Britannica about 200 years ago to describe the religion as being different from Buddhism, Jainism, Sikhism. The original word is Sanatana Dharma. Sanatana means the original Dharma way of life. So you have all these ways of life under Sanatana Dharma. Do you know how the word India comes? It's a Persian word, the land south of the river Indus. Yeah? The actual word for India was Bharat. Bharat is the name of that land. India was the name given by the Persians. Yeah? So Hindu comes from Indus river. So, Sanatana Dharma is predicated on one principle. Unlike the Abrahamic faiths which are linear, birth, life, death, heaven or hell, this is cyclical. Yeah? So you're born, you have life, based on what you do in your life, if you live a good life, when you die, you're born again in a better potential. So if the dog lives a good life, it has the opportunity then to be born as a human being. Now today, we may think that it's not so great to be a human being. But let me tell you, it's fantastic. Because you have the most advanced system sitting in your skull. Most advanced piece of machinery in the cosmos sitting out here. So it is a great potential. Whether we use it or no is different. But you have the potential. So based, if the dog has had a good life, it then is born as a species that has an opportunity to liberate itself. We consider human being as the only species that can liberate oneself. If you are a human being and you've had a despicable life, then you may then the next time be born as a tree or as a dog. And you'll have to work your way up again to human and from human to this is the basic idea. You can believe, not believe, it's not important. But one thing that we see is that everything in the cosmos is in cycles. Yeah. However, we feel sometimes that our life is linear. And yet we see that there are patterns, everything is cyclical. So there's a good chance that that may be a right idea. Yeah. So the idea is that at some point I was a mineral, at some point I was a rock, at some point I was a plant, at some point I was an animal, at some point I am... Yeah. One of the reasons why uh, in that culture, uh, taking care of animals or not eating them and so on and so forth was ingrained. Because at some point I was that. It's part of my DNA. Right? Uh, the point that we are coming to is that, so what is the purpose of life? There are four purposes of life. Artha, material wealth. You don't need to write this. It's not Artha, material success. If you don't have it once at least in life, you'll feel a little. Artha, karma, love. At least once in life, you have to experience love. Dharma, righteous living. You have to live a good life. And finally, moksha. So they understood that you cannot just seek liberation unless you have experienced love, success. When I say material, it can be just fame also. You're, you're, you're well known. Moksha. So what is moksha? Moksha means you're liberating from the cycle of birth, death, birth, death, birth, death. Now, liberation, how does this happen? We're going to study it with the Buddha in greater detail. But you need to know it from Krishna's perspective also. Essentially, what the Buddha has taught us is that when you reach a state of desirelessness, 
why are we reborn the idea is that i have some unfulfilled desires so i have to energy has to experience all of that so another life and another life and then another life yeah. eventually the same things happening again and again and again till i come to a point where i understand the nature of desire i have understood all my desires so the buddha reaches a state of desirelessness therefore there's no need to come back does that make sense yeah so that is the idea of sanatana dharma all the religions that come from the indian subcontinent have this theme so what krishna does very interestingly is he introduces four rather three kinds of yoga right as we discussed yesterday karma yoga bhakti yoga jnana yoga can you give me the key point for bhakti yoga people bhakti yoga devotion jnana yoga not knowledge not intellect sorry enquiry enquiry intellect is a very misleading word uh, you can be a real it may not you can be intellectual but not intelligent enquiry karma yoga service okay now you can be working in an ngo right in an orphanage but the reason you're working there is for the credit that you get the appreciation you get from your friends and family so that's not karma yoga otherwise everybody could have been a can volunteer once a week and call themselves karma yogis no the intent you can be an industrialist multi billion dollar industrialist the intent is to create jobs for people to create livelihood for people that's karma yogi you can be in the orphanage but you want to serve that's a karma yogi yeah so please let's not make it so simplistic that anybody who volunteers is a karma yogi a lot of people volunteer to put it up on instagram right? or a generation ago to tell their friends that's not karma yoga that's that's good you do you're going to the thing but the intent is not service and you can be running a very successful business today business gets bad press but people are working really hard to set up enterprises and sustaining so many families of people working there i'm not talking about all the businesses but there are some beautiful businesses that is karma yoga clear there are two points that you got to remember in karma yoga karmani eva adhikaraste ma phaleshu kadachana you cannot let go of your responsibilities if you are a mother you have to be a mother you cannot run away from that and say now i am on some spiritual journey you have to do your duties yeah no running away from duties if i'm a teacher you knock my door at 12 o'clock with a question i have to answer you thankfully i'm leaving tonight so you can't knock the door <laughs> but if i'm a teacher i have to teach it's my dharma right if i try and run away from that i'm not living my dharma like that for you, you should know what is your dharma that's one second quality is that you let go of the fruit of your labor now suppose i have worked the whole year and i thought i've done a good job and when it's time for me to get my appraisal my manager doesn't give me the praise or doesn't give me a good appraisal now i'm frustrated i say bloody hell i hate my job you didn't hate your job you loved it but you didn't get the appreciation you thought you deserved right imagine living without worrying about the result every single act that you do can be free yeah general example some mother will cook a good meal for the kids the kids come and eat it they are rubbish 
and suddenly the mother's pissed. You didn't cook it. You thought you cooked it for them. You cooked it because you wanted to cook it. You like to cook it. You didn't get the appreciation from the kid. Now you're angry. Happens in couples all the time. You made breakfast, but she or he uh, didn't care, went out for a ride and came back at lunchtime. Now you're irritated. I did this for you. No, you didn't do it for them. You didn't get the appreciation and therefore life becomes sour. Is that right? If you can live life without that worry, that's karma yoga. Imagine the quality of your life. Yeah? If you can do your stuff and not worry about the other's appreciation. Yeah? It's very important in our day and age because work is a big part of our life. So you're using work as your prayer. How beautiful is that? Yeah? Your work becomes your prayer. Everything becomes your prayer. You can either combine two like a Mother Teresa and dedicate your work in Bhakti Yoga to Jesus. Or you can do them separately. You don't need to have faith also. You just want to serve and help people. Service. Yeah? Are, are we clear? If you're not clear, there's a problem. Tomorrow I tell you, before the class, come and sweep the shala. You come and sweep it with an angry face. Yeah? So many yoga schools, you know, they tell the students, come and clean the shala. That's karma yoga. That's not karma yoga. Yeah? If you do it out of your own joy, that, okay, I don't want my friends to get dirty, that's beautiful. But you're doing it just because it's on the roster. And you think, bloody hell, I didn't sign up for this. Why should I be sweeping? That's not karma yoga. The intent is very important. Yeah. It's better not to sweep then. As Khalil Gibran would say, if you don't like your work, work is love made visible. If you don't like your work, it's better to sit on the steps of the temple and beg alms from those who love their work. Yeah. If you do your work without that service thing, something is something bitter happens. Why is everybody's face suddenly like... It's the same as if you do something nice because you want to get something back, not just doing something nice. Yeah, yeah. We always, we always want something back. I appreciate that, but you shouldn't choose to want to do it, right? Yeah. Now, imagine if you can live your life without caring about the appreciation. You just do. How free can you be? Is there anything you do in life without, the, without wanting something in return? Possibly not. Yeah. I don't mean to sound rude, but this is the fact of life. You can do an honest appraisal at lunchtime or later. Is there anything that I do without wanting a result? Yeah. If you can find one thing, you're quite good. You're very good. It's very difficult, very difficult. Any and everything we do is with a certain motivation. And therefore, it limits freedom that I can have. Right? Uh, when you look at a person who is not like that, there's a beauty. Yeah? You, look like, you look at Van Gogh paint. He's not painting for you. Yeah? He's painting just out of his joy. He died as a pauper. Nobody knew he was a painter. So such kind of people are very unique. If you have a friend like that, or if you're like that, right? they're very beautiful, very beautiful. To do at least one thing in life without any, without trying to gain something from it. But even if you do it in order to gain joy, it's still... It's not karma yoga. It might be good for you and me, but it's not karma yoga. I'm, I'm not, not criticizing what you're doing. No, no, I'm not. Yeah, not criticizing. You do something for joy, it's beautiful. At least you're doing something for joy. Maybe there'll come a day when you're doing it for no reason. Then the magic starts. Yeah. If there's something that you do and you're willing to invest your time, energy, for no reason. Yeah. Have you met somebody like that? 
<laughs> They're very beautiful people. Just do it, bigger. The kings, king, the real kings of the world. Eh? Sorry? I, I didn't hear you. So just repeat it, I'll hear. Repeat. Sorry, what did you say? I didn't hear. You know, please say now, now it's intriguing for me. Yeah. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Sure. I'm trying to tell. I'm trying to say this. This idea that if I serve people and someday it will come back to me limits karma yoga, because somewhere I have an idea. I'm doing. It. I'm doing this with my love. I'm doing it with my love. I don't expect anything from you. But somewhere there's an idea at the back of my head that universe will help me at some point. Then it's the same thing. Either you give it to me or the universe gives it to me. Uh, clear? You may be right, but that's not karma yoga. Karma yoga is you remove that idea also. Yeah, yeah. So karma yoga is if you let go of that idea also, then you're genuinely free. It's not easy. Krishna's path is not easy. But did you make out the distinction? Theoretically, you may be right. But if you let go of even that idea, then we are talking karma yoga. What you're talking is karma. Karma is, as you sow, so shall you reap. Whatever you do, will happen to you. That's the theory of karma. Karma yoga is different. It's deeper. Is that clear? I think you were talking about dharma in the Karma. 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 Karma yoga. Karma yoga. Is that clear for everybody? Yeah? Uh, the absolute beauty of living a life with zero expectations. Yeah? And then you live your most beautiful life. Dharma yoga is not a yoga. Dharma means righteous living. Dharma, righteous living. It's, it's one of the attainments of life. Artha, Kama, Dharma, Moksha. Clear? You want to take a break? Is it getting very heavy? <laughs> No, no, no. Dharma is what you've chosen in life. It's your path. Karma is everything that you do. What you do, conscious, subconscious, unconscious, will come back. Dharma is a way of life. It's a way of life. Conscious, unconscious is immaterial there. It's a way of life that you're walking. Quick water break and we'll start again. We have 5,000 years to cover in two hours. <laughs> if you see where I live, you'll, you'll, you'll know why I want to go back. Guys, just a two minute break, not more. What happens is I'm in a flow, and uh, every time I sit to write that, it breaks. Exactly. I'll write it in the end. I'll write in the end. I know what you're saying. 
I find it very difficult. Every time I have to write, I have to break my. I'm, I'm just storytelling. It's there in the book. It's all there in the book. What I'll do at the end of the class, I'll do a board with all of you. I'll do it at the end of the class. Just remind me. Indians are all like chocolate ice cream. Hmm? Indians all like chocolate ice cream. He didn't write any book. Exactly. You don't like it. Come on, guys, let's get started. Rock and roll. Your legs. Please feel free to stand, sit, lie down, whatever you want to do. Be as relaxed as you can. Just don't be too far. I have to keep shouting. Over the next 23 days, a lot of your views on life are going to get challenged. A lot of your views on life are going to get challenged. And yoga is that fire. Yeah. It will burn away all the views that you have. Right? You can either live or you can think about life. Now, I'd like to introduce this thing to you. In yoga, yoga is considered one of Darshans. Darshan. The word darshan, D A R S H A N, darshan means to see. You'll be amazed to know that there is no Sanskrit word for philosophy. Yeah? We speak a lot about Indian philosophy. There is no word for philosophy in Sanskrit. Because the system is not interested in creating ideas about life. It is interested in making you live life. Darshan means to see. So you become a seer of life, not a thinker of life. In the whole of Asia, you will never find a statue like this. You'll never find Rod as thinker. This is not the approach. The approach is meditation. I want to understand what life is, not think of life. Please, there's a big difference. Yeah? So that is why there's no word for philosophy. So you will not find in this, in that part of the world, anybody who are thinkers about life, they are either Buddhas or they are not. Yeah? Is that okay? Yoga is one of six darshans. Nyaya, Vaisheshika, Mimam. You don't need to know this. You are here to study yoga. But I am not going to limit myself just to the book. Nyaya, Vaisheshika, Mimamsa, the old Mimamsa, the new one we call Vedanta, Samkhya, and Yoga. What I want you to appreciate is that it's a very creative culture. There are six different ways to enlightenment, not one. You can choose Yoga, may not work for you. You can choose Samkhya, Nyaya. There are different ways. Yeah? What we are understanding now is the yoga approach. So we saw with Krishna, he made it accessible to everybody. Bhakti yoga, karma yoga, jnana yoga. It's very unique because before him, you were either an ascetic or you were a family person. Krishna is very unique because he's a politician, 
married, he's active in life, and at the same time, he's a spiritual master. Do you know why we have the lotus as a symbol? Anybody? No? Okay. The lotus grows in muck, in mud, then comes out into the water, and then the flower blooms out. So an ability to be deeply meditative in the milieu of life is highly regarded. Yeah? If you're locked here for the next one year, you will be disciplined. That's not the challenge. The challenge is, can you be disciplined in your house, in your life, with your family, with your folks? That's what you're training for in yoga. Okay? So that is why the lotus is a big symbol in the Orient. Yeah, it, you will not find a lotus in nice, clear water. It has to be quite dirty. And then you get this beautiful flower coming out. So with Krishna, he introduces the idea of yoga in your daily life. Karma yoga, jnana yoga, bhakti yoga. The next one that we look at is Raja yoga. But before we get to Raja yoga, let's study the Buddha. Are we clear with Krishna's contribution? Do you want me to take you through that, the iconography of the statue? Okay. Now what happens is that the Mahabharata, so Mahabharata is a poem of about 100,000 verses, right, in perfect meter. It's the, old, it's the longest poem of the world. In that, the story runs and it finally comes to 18 chapters of the Bhagavad Gita, that's part of the Mahabharata, and then it continues. The story is such that there's a family, three, there's a king who's blind, therefore the kingdom goes to his younger brother, and now this man has a hundred children, and this man, the younger brother, has five children. So from the king, it should go down to the five children. But this man says, I was the elder brother, and therefore the kingdom should go back to my children. That's the setting. So these hundred are greedy, and they want to usurp the kingdom. In nature, they're a little bit on the wrong side. Right? And therefore, they push these five into exile. When they come back, they suppo they're supposed to get back the kingdom, but they're not given it. Things come to such a pass that the two cousins, the two sections go to war. Right? At the point of this war, Krishna is a charioteer to Arjuna. Right? Now the charioteer is a metaphor for somebody who is driving you in a particular direction. So Arjuna says that, I don't want to fight this war. Even if I win, I'm going to be killing my cousins, my uncles, my teachers. What is the use of such a victory? That is the question. To explain to him, to motivate him, Krishna teaches the Bhagavad Gita. The first point is, if you are a king, it is your dharma to righteously govern your kingdom. Therefore, if these people have usurped your kingdom and are torturing your citizens, it is your dharma to fight, take back your kingdom and govern it righteously. If you run away from this battlefield, you are not living your dharma. Is that clear? That's the first point of karma yoga. You cannot run away from responsibilities. You're a king. If you, if you run away from the battlefield... Now, please put this in your own life context. Many times, somebody in your family, somebody in your work, is acting like a real idiot. You don't have the moral courage to tell them, listen, behave decently. 
Rather, you give yourself an excuse that, oh, they feel bad. Has it happened to all of us? Many times, you don't have the moral courage to stand up and do what is your dharma. If you're, whatever is your role in the family, whatever is your role at work, if it is your dharma to do it, you have to do it. It may not be pleasant, but you have to do it. But a lot of the times we tell ourselves, no, 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 it will hurt them. Rubbish. We don't have the moral courage to address the issue. Yeah? And therefore, we end up sort of making excuses. After a few years, the situation gets disgusting. It was not corrected at the right time. And now it's become an issue for everybody. Like that, Arjuna is trying to run away. He's having this moral thing that even if I win, I'll kill everybody. So Krishna starts to talk to him. He says that karma yoga, first, you don't run away from responsibilities. Second, the result is not in your hands. You do what you have to do. The result is not in your hands. He goes on to talk to him. He says, if you think that you're killing or you're dying, you have not understood anything about life. Yeah? People are born and dying every day. Life goes on. The body becomes old and is cast away like clothes and you take on a new body. Now, this is what he explains. I'm not going to delve into that. I briefly mentioned it when I discussed Sanatana Dharma, cycle of life and death. He says that if you think that you're killing somebody, no. Life is happening through you. Okay. You have to do your dharma. Do what has to be done. Life will happen through you. are not killing or you're not doing anything. You just do what you have to do. Is that okay? This is a very, very beautiful way. Just one second. It's a very, very beautiful way in which he inspires Arjuna to do his duties. After the battle is over, they win. After that, they have to go and do penance. Because, yes, they have killed their cousins, they have killed their uncles. They have to do penance. But not having won that war would have meant that they don't live their responsibilities. Does that put things in perspective? The beauty of that Mahabharata, of Bhagavad Gita, is it's grey. Only in India, you'll get a spiritual book, a spiritual master, talking on the battlefield. <laughs> See the contradiction. He's inspiring this guy to take up the bow and arrow and fight. With the greatest ideas you'll find in mankind's library, about what is life. Okay? With this beautiful analogy of going to war. Okay? Understanding what is life, what is death. So that is, whenever, when you go in Bali, you'll see those statues, right? The, or you'll see a, uh, you know, statues made of the warrior. That, that is what is happening there. He's explaining the Bhagavad Gita, explaining Karma Yoga, Jnana Yoga, Bhakti Yoga. What I want you to appreciate is that here is a man who understands that suppose you don't have faith, no problem. You can approach through the mind, Jnana Yoga. Suppose you don't have an inquiry, no problem. You can serve. You can approach any which way. Now in the Christian or the Islamic tradition, if you don't have faith, there's no role for you there. I'm a Christian by birth, right? So if I don't have faith, there's no scope for me in the church. Right? It's bhakti yoga. But he understands that people are different. You may not have faith, it's fine. You can approach through the, through the inquiry. Maybe you're not an inquiry person, you can still serve. People are different. This is the beauty of Krishna. His understanding of a human being is very, very advanced. Can we move on to the Buddha now? 
Why do we like the Buddha so much? Why is he a global superstar? I have a question for you. Why do Buddha statues have no beard? Tell me at lunchtime. <laughs> Please think about it. A man living in a forest, why the, is he going to be shaving every day? No. So why the hell doesn't he have a beard? You got to tell me at lunchtime. Why do we like the Buddha so much? Yeah. Buddha is the first person in history who says take responsibility for your life right? in his time the indian culture was such if there are no rains if my daughter is not getting married i'll go to a priest he'll do some rituals and through that process the gods will be propitiated and good fortune will come same thing in israel animal sacrifice same thing in south america same thing in ancient greece everywhere very ritualistic yeah just one second very ritualistic with the buddha he says it doesn't matter if there's god or no what matters is if there is what are you doing about it if there is no what are you doing about it yeah this is this is very important even 2500 years after he's dead and gone we can't take responsibility for our life yeah? i want to blame my government i want to blame god i want to blame the elements i want to blame my partner i want to blame my parents i am having a bad day i want to blame everybody else with the buddha he doesn't give that option that is why he is so ahead of his times yeah he removes all the drama you are having a bad time it's your problem you sort it out this is why we like the buddha so much because he is a rebel right he rebels against 2000 years of his tradition everybody is going through the gods he never answered the question he said if i say yes there is god you'll go back home saying buddha said if i say no you'll go back home saying buddha said you are never going to ask so i don't care to answer he's not atheist he's not atheist he's agnostic he said doesn't matter if there is or not that's not the important question important question is what are you doing about it right a little bit about the buddha's life when he was born a lot of astrologers said he'll be a very great sage or a very great king he belonged to a princely family uh he, his father was a clan leader so he was brought up as a prince his father was obviously keen that he doesn't leave the palace and runs the kingdom so he shielded him he never got a chance to go out of the palace right at the age of 29 for the first time he left he was living a beautiful luxurious life for the first time he went out and he saw four things he saw a sick man so he immediately realized my health is transient some day i'm going to be sick i am going to suffer two he, he saw a poor man he said okay suffering is there he saw an old man he said okay even my youth is transient i am going to become 70 one day so what i am basing my life on is transient it's not permanent Five, four he saw a dead man he said oh even life is impermanent it's going to go therefore it had a huge impact on him so he said that the basis of life is suffering okay. if the basis of life is suffering how do i come out of this suffering now please note at the age of 29 on the night that 
his wife delivered a son, he leaves the palace. Yeah? If any man were to leave you on the night you deliver a child, you're not going to forgive the guy. But we are talking about history's favorite child. So much so that when he reached enlightenment at 35 and came back to the palace, right, met his wife. There's a beautiful story. So his wife touches his feet because now he has become the Buddha. He's something beautiful. Right? If you, you cannot think of a more selfish act. You walk away on the lady the day that she's delivered a child. But because he became something so beautiful, something that we aspire to, that history forgives him. He walks away not because he's running away, per se. He walks away because he cannot live that life anymore. Being a king, being a father means nothing to him. At that point, he says, no, I have to find truth. Unlike you and me, for us, it is something that we take seriously. But are we willing to change our life 100% in the search for truth? Maybe not. Maybe not. For him, the answer is yes. He walks away. Okay. It's so interesting that when he comes back, I'm just taking a leap, I'll come back to those years. But since we spoke about him and his wife, he says, if I knew what is enlightenment, I would never have had to leave the palace. Okay. But you can't get that knowledge without going on a journey. Okay. So he leaves, he becomes a monk. For the next six years, he goes through austerities like never before. He joins a meditation school. He has a guru. He learns meditation, meditation, meditation. He becomes so good at it that the teacher says, you also become a teacher with the same respect that's given to me. You also become a teacher here. But he's honest to say that all these years of meditation, has not got me closer to the truth. How many of us will have that honesty? You fight with your folks, you say, no, I'm going to pursue meditation, you leave everything and go. Now you find after two, three years, no result. Most of us are not going to go back and tell our folks, listen, I'm... actually nothing happened. You want to still convince them that you're doing something special. Is that right? Is that right? Yeah? Maybe nothing special is happening. But we may not have the honesty to tell our friends who we have tried to convince for years that meditation is beautiful. Nothing beautiful is happening to us. But we don't have the courage to say honestly that I'm not coming closer to the truth. He had that courage. He walks away. He joins another school. There, they are doing austerities, fasting, 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 to the point where for about six months he's not eaten. He's surviving on some water, some nuts. He's become emaciated. After three years of that, finally he says, even this is not working. Here's a very honest person. Suppose you and me fast for six months, We'll go and give a TED talk on it. <laughs> Whether we've come to truth or no is not important. But we want to tell our story. You, I've done something special in my life. But Buddha is not like that. He is in it for the truth. He says, even this is not working. So he leaves. When he leaves, his five fellow students, they tell him, you're giving up. You're, you're giving up on the dream. Yeah? But he knows that even this has not helped him. So he leaves. At that point, a lady gives him food. He's like a beggar, right? He gives him food. He eats that food. He sits to meditate. So basically, he's given up on the second system also, the austerities. He sits to meditate that night. On that night, 
over the next 12 hours one of the greatest one of the greatest experiences of mankind happens he reaches to this enlightened state okay. something beautiful happens in those 12 hours this is why we like the buddha is a man becoming divine divine is a mis misappropriated word it's a man becoming human yeah. Yeah. is a man attaining to the highest potential possible this is why we like the buddha it means that we can also there's no difference between him and us just that strong desire discipline to go beyond now he is reached to bliss but he says that i will continue to come back and back and back till everyone has not reached to buddhahood so first thing he goes and finds the five friends and he teaches them if you go to india you have to visit this place sarnath where he gives his first sermon the wheel the dharma the wheel of buddhism is set in motion what does he teach i'm going to share two things what is the buddha's teaching the four noble truths life is suffering if there's anybody here who doesn't experience suffering please put your hand up you're either a buddha or a liar there is suffering in life so first truth there is suffering but he is not lazy he is not going to stop at that second if there is suffering there is a cause third if there is a cause that's the magic now he's talking a lot of us say ah there's suffering there's a cause but we leave it at that he is not that kind of a lazy guy there is suffering if there is suffering there is a cause if there is a cause there is an end if there is an end there is a path that path is called the buddhist or he calls the dharma clear there is suffering there is a cause therefore there is an end if there is an end there is a path the path that he teaches is what makes him so special clear with the buddha's message so he is a gnana yogi inquiry and a raja yogi meditation he done he his journey was selfish solo after he reaches enlightenment completely selfless he is reached at 35 there's no need for him to do anything in bliss but he said i will teach for the next 50 years of his life he teaches people he's begging for his meal every day eating teaching this is history's favorite child is begging for his meal every day no luxury he lives like the monks in his order till the age of 83 for nearly 50 years he walks around india teaching 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 so the point i'm making is that however you reach raja yoga nyana yoga ultimately any saint any buddha will only serve karma yoga is not how he reaches but once he reaches his whole life is karma yoga he has no desire he can be gone there's no desire can you imagine there's no desire says to come into that state and therefore i will continue to teach real life real life this is his life buddha is a real person krishna we don't know yeah? believe is real not not important buddha lived 
So he goes on to teach and teach and teach. The word Buddha, his name is Siddharth Gautam. Siddharth, Gautam is his clan. Buddha is a generic word for an enlightened being. Clear with the Buddha? Taking responsibility for life, just one sec. Taking responsibility for life, the four noble truths, and the eightfold path. He introduces this idea of the middle path. Now, please understand the genius of the guy. Right? Can I just get your attention for a minute, folks? If you understand this, you'll get his journey. In your school days, you remember the guy who was topping the class and the guy who was failing. You remember the people who were great at sport or who were terrible at sport. You don't remember anybody in the middle. The ego is like this. It likes to be in the edges. I'm either vegan or I love meat. There's no glory if you're, okay, sometimes vegan, sometimes meat. You cannot show off. There's no ego in the middle. This is the genius of the guy. He says, live in the middle path. Try living in the middle path. You cannot hang on to anything. It seems very simple, but it's not that simple. The mind likes the extremes. Yeah? Go to the top years in one hour, 15 minutes. 